So hi, I'm Jim Cantrell. I'm uh, CEO of Vector. Um, for those that don't know me, I see some familiar faces in the audience. I'm uh, what I refer to as a human barnacle in the uh, aerospace industry. Um, I've been in this business for most of my career. I probably never wanted to get into space in the beginning, but I kind of threw a series of uh, serendipitous encounters, <laughs> ended up becoming quite involved in space. And I, not to say I don't love it, I do, but uh, you know, all our lives have these interesting paths, right? And uh, if you'd have told me uh, in, in 1979 that I would be standing here in front of all you talking about a currency that you can't touch, feel, or smell, and rockets that go hundreds of times a year, and uh, private uh, citizens building their own satellites, I'd have said you're nuts. So, uh, but that's the reality where we are today, and this is a gathering of some really unique, interesting people. I, I just had a uh, interview with Jesse Ventura, which was was interesting. And Dennis Kucinich, um this morning, I, I I met met him. Do you guys, everybody know who Dennis Kucinich is? Okay, so he's a congressman from Ohio, and I don't know if he's still a congressman or not. But he's uh, I I don't mean to get pol political here, but he he's he's the only Democrat I like because he tells the truth. Uh, I could say that about all politicians, by the way. So I had a really great conversation with him this morning about space. And these guys, yeah, everybody gets excited about this stuff, which is, which is interesting. I mean, Jesse Ventura, of course, he's, he's his own thing, right? So anyway, well, let me give you just a little briefing on, on what we're doing. Um, you, you might recognize some of these slides from yesterday. I'm going to not apologize, but I'm just going to let you know. <laughs> um, so a, a new space race is really here. And it's not run by company or by governments. It's run by private corporations. And this story started a long time ago, um, with uh, really long before even Elon and SpaceX. And there was a number of people uh, back in the '80s who really got tired of waiting on the U.S. government, and in some cases, some of the foreign governments, to do something. Um, as, as time went on, and we we finished the Apollo space race. What really came about was a situation where uh, it became a jobs program for, for many countries, even Europe and, and so forth. And it was less about doing something worthwhile in space and more about keeping your job. And as I got into space, I, I came in on the promise of Apollo, and that's what, that's what really interested me, okay? And to come in and find out that our, that our in, in industry was really more looking like the IRS than it was a some sort of you know front edge technical uh, institution that that was appalling to me. So I, from the very beginning, sort of found myself on the outside of what people consider the military industrial complex, and uh, I ended up going over, getting involved in a, a mission uh, to Mars that was both Soviet and French, and I ended up working in France for a number of years, like you probably heard yesterday. But that was all citizen funded, and that was because. I mean, I, I used to think of the, you know, the typical little old lady with her $20 check that would send money into the planetary society to send me to France to go, uh, go work on this mission because they wanted to see this done. They didn't care what country was doing. They didn't care that, that uh, you know, somebody was going to take credit. They wanted to see it done. So that spirit has evolved. And, you know, SpaceX, one of the reasons I think it's so powerful, and this is one of their Falcon 9 rockets, is it's so powerful because it gives the ordinary person sort of the feel and taste of what what space really is about and what that dream that you know we were promised as as uh, Ernest Hancock said yesterday I want my Star Trek damn it uh, <laughs> you know it, it's it's real it's happening and it doesn't look like you know the 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 Enterprise it doesn't look like the Hilton Hotel in space from Space Odyssey but this is what it looks like. And what the astonishing thing is, I think, is that over the next five years, we're going to launch more satellites in orbit than in all of humankind prior to this. Isn't that an amazing statistic? Think about it. So do you guys think those are government satellites? The majority of them are commercial. Okay, These are people like you sitting in the audience that just said, damn it, we're going to do this. So let's talk a little bit about the technology behind this. Um, we all have cell phones in their pockets. So Jesse Ventura told me something interesting. He said, I have never owned a cell phone and I never will. I'm going to die <laughs> the last human being without a cell phone. <laughs> but but this, uh, this cell phone's an amazing thing. It's, 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 it's a weapon, like I said yesterday, of a new form. It's a technology that has pushed its way into space. So some of this early microsat technology literally was putting a phone in space. There was something called PhoneSat 
that later became uh, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, Planet Lab guys, and this was funded by some wackos at, at Na NASA that had nothing uh, but disgust for the way NASA was doing things, and they funded a project where they literally put a phone, it was a Google phone, by the way, not an iPhone, uh, into uh, space. And this started the whole business of how do, we, how do we integrate that technology into this thing called CubeSats. And CubeSats have been around a long time, by the way. There was a, a professor from Idaho State University that invented this. He's now at Stanford, but he, um, he wanted to do this for, for kids to learn with, for students. And that came from something called a getaway special years ago that used to fly on the, on the space shuttle um, that was uh, all privately funded as well for students. So, so the, the, the CubeSat is just a form that's, that's sort of started to accept this microsat technology. And what it's done is remarkable. So we've taken the equivalent functionality and taken it from something the size of a car that weighs as, as much as a car, that costs hundreds of millions of dollars, and we put it into something that we can do for hundreds of thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars, and it's the size of a loaf of bread. That's an amazing thing. Of course, if you have phones in your hand, you know, some people are videotaping this. You know, it used to be big video cameras that you used to carry around. I mean, this is, this is the world we're living in, and it's finally making its way to space. And it's, it's massively disruptive. It's every bit as disruptive as, as cryptocurrency. And that's why I personally see the connection between cryptocurrency and what we're doing in space with microsatellites. So with respect to Vector, um, Vector has an interesting little history. Let me... Uh, just go back, I know I talked about this yesterday, but for those of you that weren't there, um, when Elon called me out of the blue in 2001 and wanted to you know, go buy Russian rockets and we failed to do that, he decided to build his own rocket. And the reason that happened was one of the guys I first brought on when we were, uh, when we were first talking to Elon was John Garvey. And John had been building rockets in his garage instead of like what I would do is build a race car. Um, and Elon saw this, and he was so impressed by what John and his friends were doing with almost no money in the garage with his wife's permission. And uh, in fact, the first rocket he built was called Kimbo because his wife is named Kim, right? And uh, so she's finally today, you know, now that we're making some real money out of this thing, she's like, okay, now that was maybe a good idea. But for years, <laughs> John had to beg forgiveness every day. But uh, Elon saw this, and he had some sort of almost uh, religious experience, is what I'd call it. And uh, he decided that he wanted to build a rocket, and he could do it. So that's how SpaceX came about. Um, just a little aside, um, so, so along the way, Elon made me fire a couple of guys, and they ended up going to Jeff Bezos, and that's how Blue Origin started. So these three companies started at the same point in time because John went on his way. John... John decided that, that the thing to do was to start with a very small rocket, and that was the thing he was trying to work on. We couldn't convince Elon to do that as a, just a starting point, not an economically viable thing to do, but it was a, a technically viable thing to do. Elon's point was the market's not here, and he was right. The market is here today, however. So John, in his belief that this would someday happen, went on his, out to the desert for 15 years, building this rocket, testing the engines, blowing them up, fixing them, blowing them up, fixing them. He went through all that painful process so when I uh, began to see that the time was now for this rocket that John always had in his mind, I sold my SpaceX stocks and I went and bought his company, and that's how we formed Vector. So, so we really are sort of the initial SpaceX DNA. Uh, you know, they've obviously gone a lot further than us with a lot more money as well, but uh, that's where it comes from. So our vision really is different. In, in a way, we're taking a, a page from the, from the SpaceX playbook, which is to build an ecosystem. So Elon, in my view, is building an e ecosystem to go to Mars. We want to build an ecosystem to do commerce in space. So what we want to do is transform what today is a very uh, hardware-centric, high capital cost industry into one that's software-centric. I'm guessing most of you guys out here are coders of one form or another, right? And the reality is, I used to code, uh, Kerningham and Ritchie C, right? Probably very few of you know what that even is anymore. Um, but the reality is that, that the innovation in today's society is, is in software. It's because, you, you know, my kids, I give them a phone, and they can make it do things in five minutes I couldn't figure out in a week. And uh, the, this new generation relates at that level, and we have to produce a capability in space that is commensurate with that talent in our society and that, that sort of innovation. So I'm not smart enough to know all the ways we can exploit space, but I am smart enough to know how to give you the tools. And so that's what we're trying to do. 
So to lower the barriers to space access, we're really doing it in two pieces. Um, we're starting off, we've got to build the launch vehicles because right now all there are are very large launch vehicles like the Falcon 9, which is a great vehicle. But if you look at what that is compared to what the satellite is, you can launch, you know, a thousand of, of these microsats on one of their vehicles. So if you think that's okay, let me suggest then maybe if you want to share your home with 10 other families, that's okay too, because that's kind of what it ends up being when you fly a satellite on another rocket with somebody, you end up sort of the equivalent of a family sharing a home with somebody else. And uh, that doesn't always work so well. So what the market really needs is high rate, right sized vehicles that are affordable, that, that fly every day. We're talking flying every day of the year. And uh, then the second part of that then is these, what we call software defined satellites. And so that's where the cryptocurrency interest comes in. That's one of the, that's one of the apps, you know, one of the very first things that I became aware of when I started talking to Colin about this was, he said, wow, why don't we put cryptocurrency up there? And I, first I said, that's a stupid idea. But then, <laughs> you know, I have to admit, so a lot of Colin's ideas I've thought were stupid. They've been really good. So. <laughs> So he's, he's a bright kid and, uh, you know, he's, he's proved me wrong more than a few times. So that's all right. I accept that. And uh, so cryptocurrency is a natural for this sort of thing. So uh, so let's talk a little bit about the vehicle family. Uh, we, we're we starting with, with the smaller one, which we call the R, uh, Vector R. And the R stands for Rapide. And one of our, one of our founders is French. So I, I, I mercilessly tease him all the time, even with naming our launch vehicles. So... That was the fastest way to get to market was this small one. And as we, as we did the market studies, it actually has a pretty good um, coverage of, of what we think our addressable market is. About 25% of what we think the users will be will use this. Now, if we put an, an auxiliary upper stage on it, that expands it to about half the, the addressable market. So the other side of that then is to make a larger vehicle. We call it the H. Now, again, using a little humor, that stands for heavy. <laughs> so... All these vehicle manufacturers have to have a heavy launch vehicle. So I thought I'd make fun of Elon and, and have a heavy myself. So that's about 300 pounds to orbit. And it uses all the same parts that, that the R is made of. The tank's a little bit bigger. We have a little more first stage engines in it. But like General Motors, um, you know, they make the, the big motorhomes out of the same parts they make their cars out of. They make trucks out of the same parts they make the Cadillacs out of and so on. Using that same automotive technique, we here are going to build the rockets in different sizes, and we can dynamically allocate how we manufacture these. So if the market turns out different than we think it is today, then we can adjust to it without really any, any damage to our, our business plan. So if you look at what all the various vehicles that are being built are compared to us, you can see over on the right-hand side, that's the, that's the new NASA rocket, SLS. I call it the rocket to nowhere. It's, it's like the bridge to nowhere. It's, it's a great jobs program. Um, do, does anybody know what the cost to launch one of those is? The latest estimate? Any guesses? 500 mil? We got 500 mil. Anybody want to go higher? Billion. Anyone would go higher? Three billion. I got a winner back there. <laughs> so how often do you think they're going to launch this beast? Once a decade. I go once a decade. Probably a little lower. Anyone a bit a little lower? Never. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. About every 18 months. Yeah. Not far off. So, so yeah, that's what we're spending our taxpayer dollars on. Aren't you proud? So we've got next to it the Saturn V that took us to the moon. We've got the uh, privately funded Blue Origin rockets. Nobody really knows what Jeff's going to do with his rockets, by the way. We, uh, we all scratch our head and nobody talks. He's a very secretive organization. That's fine with me, but it's very interesting. I can't wait to see what he's going to do with them. So personally, I think it's a tourist thing. I think he'll send a lot of people up on a little short hop and bring them back, that sort of thing. That's what it looks like. Who knows? There's, there's some commercial applications there I'm aware of as well, but you don't build a rocket that big with just that in mind. So that's, that's why I scratched my head. Maybe you're right. Then maybe that's all they'll ever do. Who knows? Um, I don't think so either. So then we've got the Falcon Heavy, which is clearly part of the Mars plan. Falcon 9. I th you know, one thing, interesting thing about SpaceX is they take their capability off the market, like Falcon 1, and then the early Falcon 9s are a lot smaller. They take it off to make room for the bigger stuff. So it's all this march towards Mars. And if you look at landing the rocket, everybody says, oh, great, you know, we get to save all this money. Actually, you don't save money. I can prove it to you mathematically. 
But what it does, it does make their business case more attractive because now they don't have to rebuild that first stage, which is logistically difficult, takes time, so they can get their flight rates up so they can, they can take their infrastructure costs and use it over a greater number of launches. So it does make the launch cheaper, but not for the reasons you'd think. So, but that's also a good Mars technology for landing on Mars, and so that's why I think that is for. So you go down the line, you know, the, the pride of the French was the Ariane 5, and then the Soyuz, and, and then you get into the, the uh, commercial launch vehicles. Isn't it interesting that most of the commercial stuff is either very large or very small, which I find kind of funny. So we're the smallest of all the uh, rockets out there. Let me see if this works. Looks like it doesn't work. All right, so this is the Mac uh, to PC conversion. If you can see here, we're dragging a missile down the center of Tucson. Uh, it's black probably because the, the NSA's got in and, and <laughs> invalidated my, my video. So we're going to make these rockets like sausages. Uh, Khrushchev used to take his shoe off and pound the table at the UN. Did anybody remember that when he, when he did that? Yeah. <laughs> we will bury you. Yeah, so that's one of those iconic things. So I, I got to make fun of Khrushchev, right? So we're going to build our rockets like sausages, like the, rock, the Russians said they would. We really are. And we're going to franchise manufacture these, much like McDonald's franchise manufactures the hated burger. So, uh, you know, this is a different business model for us. We're building these small little factory modules that can build these rockets, which, you know, one of my rockets can fit in here. And, uh, you know, for about 10,000, 20,000 square foot, we can have a little plant that makes them and employ about 25 people. We can produce about 25 a year. So we're going to replicate those all over the world and uh, we'll be the mother parts supplier for them. But they'll get assembled just like parts assembly plants in Mexico for Ford. And uh, that's how we're going to achieve our numbers. And it's unlike anything everybody, anybody's ever done in the aerospace industry. So the other part then is we have to fly them by the hundreds. And you know, I like to tell our investors we're a manufacturing flight operations company, not a rocket company. And that's the reality. We've got to figure out how to manufacture a lot of them. And then we've got to figure out how to fly a lot of them. So on the right, you can see SpaceX on their Falcon 9. You can see what we came up on on the left. You notice the DNA similarity? <laughs> so I actually helped design the first tell for the, the Erector like you see here for SpaceX. Uh, for them, years ago, they still use the basic design. We've uh, essentially mirrored that, except we use a big text trailer that we paid $16,000 for. And uh, it was towed out by a Dodge truck. And uh, we, we would be fueled by trailers full of uh, propylene, which is kind of like propane, uh, which would be behind a Dodge truck and then liquid oxygen. So we only need a pad of concrete. Um, we've done it on, on a pad of sand. We've done it on a crossroads in a jungle. Uh, we've we've uh, done a lot of flights uh, in strange places. So what this leads us to then is a different way to make money. So, you know, it's all great to talk about the technology, but guess what? We got to make money. And I'm all about that, by the way. Um, you know, this sounds all idealistic, but we're here to make money. And that's, that's one of the things uh, that, that motivates me is to make this thing work. And so traditionally what happens in the rocket business is you start small, you can only build 10 or 12 a year, you fly about that many. And then to make more money, you have to grow the size of the rocket because you can charge more for it. So what we're ending up doing is by making more of them, we actually get something called the learning curve. So like, like a car, it's, so any car you guys drove in on, even though it's probably maybe a POS that's worth $5,000, at some point that car was new and if you were to build one of those, design and build it, would be a $10 million, $100 million piece of machinery, right? So that's essentially what rockets are, but we get the cost down to $10,000, $20,000 by producing millions of them. So the same thing happens here. The cost effect isn't as drastic, but it also creates a lot of other things that are important, like higher reliability. You know, modern cars are very reliable. When I was younger, you get a brand new car from GM, for example, and it break down driving off the lot. Um, they're much better now because of a lot of things, but part of that is the production rates are up. And the more you produce, the more reliable they become. And then the more, more the service becomes reliable. If, you know, Uber, I, I asked everybody here that, that would listen to me, you know, what's Uber like in Aspen? And they all said, oh, it's horrible, it's horrible. So I didn't use it. And then last night I used it, it was great. So, but, but, you know, Uber around the country has spotty kind of service and some like San Francisco, it's more reliable than the taxis in my experience and DC, not so much, but, uh, you know, that, that sort of reliability 
you start to you start to bake that into your plans of you know hey we, this will be available we get to use it so we think this will change the industry and stimulate the kinds of things people are already doing with satellites and they'll want to build more of them so we're going to have to launch all over the place uh, in fact we're going to we're going to become property barons on an international basis i suspect um, we need a lot of launch sites to do this we can only really realistically think of launching about uh, twice a week out of a single site which leads us to maybe a hundred per site but that's kind of on the high side right saturated um, but what we'll do is we'll find a number of sites that allow us to launch into different orbits and uh, allow us to have a have a rate that's distributed so we have a central team that stays in California that runs these things virtually and we've already proven this out that we can do this that's what we did in Georgia a couple of weeks ago and this team will then uh, direct these these launches all over the world so We'll have some in probably Hawaii, Alaska, Mexico, and on the East Coast. So these are, are seemingly simple vehicles uh, that are in our factory. This is a converted race car factory. I, I built a lot of race cars in here for about four or five years. That's what we did to make money. And uh, so when we start Vector, we just converted all that machinery over. And you can see two Block Zero vehicles. Both of them have flown. Uh, they don't look like that today, I'll tell you. Um, but uh, you can see the first stage engine on the upper right, 14 pieces. You know, these were originally made by college kids, right? And when we bought Garvey's company, um, we've tried to productionize it and make them a little more reliable. But the truth is they're just damn reliable engines to start with, and they're simple. And, and I can build each engine for about $20,000. So compare that with millions of dollars for the, the more complicated engines. So reusability, I don't need it because it just doesn't matter. So, but if I wanted to, that's a 3D printed injector, this little aluminum piece in the front, uh, I could wind a new endpoint on it like brake pads, I just replace it. So, uh, dead simple dead simple vehicle. And uh, we'll see if I can get this one to fly. Here we go, looks like we got it. It's our first flight on the Mojave. And you know, whenever you, uh, whenever you fly something, you know, you intellectually, you, you go through it and you say, what could happen? You know, what's, what's good, what's bad? You know, but then the moment before it happens, like I'm not a religious guy, but I was, I was brought up Episcopalian and right before it launches, I'm doing this, you know, <laughs> it's, you just can't help yourself because you, and when it happens, you don't believe you're seeing it. Right. So that was, that was great. That was our block zero that went about 10,000 feet and it, um, it was, came down under parachute. That one, the parachute actually failed and it came down pretty damn fast. Um, <laughs> sort of a funny little story. There's an, there's an old uh, airstrip out there, and one of the guys that runs the site where we launched this from flew his airplane, his little Cessna, up from San Diego. And uh, he, he, was, he was the guy that was always telling us, don't do this, you're going to get hurt, don't park there, don't go here. So what does he do? He parks his airplane out on this airstrip. That's where you park airplanes, I guess. And uh, this rocket came down 100 feet away from his airplane. <laughs> <laughs> so next time we'll do a little better and get closer. So you guys seen drones, right? So we parked a drone right over the top of the rocket. <laughs> I told the guys, I said, we ruined the drone, I'll pay for a new one. <laughs> but that was spectacular. We, we love that. But you can see, you know, it's just, just, it's just sand. And it took us about three hours to set this up and launch it. So even though we're going to have to work out in national ranges, we can launch this thing from anywhere. And then this was, uh, this was Georgia here. And uh, this looks like an old, you know, V2 site in Germans. I can hear the German. And uh, this was uh, out in uh, a new spaceport that's going on. There you go. It's just so cool. The uncool part about it was it landed over here in the, uh, in the jungle afterwards. And I see somebody in the audience that helped me go find it. <laughs> One of our investors was along to witness. And I don't know how you got caught up in this whole thing, but... He went left and I went right and I had my daughter with me and Colin, of course, remind me when he was a kid, he just took off like a dog through the forest to go find it. <laughs> and, and so, you know, I, after 45 minutes, nobody could find it. So I, I finally decided to get involved. I was the first guy to find it. And then, then about five minutes later, Jeff comes out and he's just covered, you know, sweat and I found it. I found it. <laughs> I was glad he was still alive. <laughs> There were, there were alligators out there and rattlesnakes and wild boars and so on. Anyway, so 
But if we if our business plan turns out the way we think it is, um, we will fly more rockets than anybody else in the business. You know, we're talking about hundreds of these things. So uh, when 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 people say who flies the most rockets in the, in the future, they'll be saying it's Vector without a doubt. And uh, we've been in business for a little over a year. We've raised over $30 million from investors. Um, we got almost $5 million from NASA and DARPA contracts. We had a bigger government contract, by the way. I won't use names, but a very big, very, very big contract that a brand name company wanted to give us. And we went down that path. It was like almost $100 million. And then it became such a pain in my ass. Um, and showing up un uninvited at our doorstep and, you know, became uh, like the unwanted mother-in-law. And uh, so I literally, I called the, the VP at the company. I said, we don't, we don't want your money. And they, they have never heard that before. <laughs> the shock and dismay. I actually thought we were going to get sued because we turned down their money, but we didn't. But we, we sold almost $400 million of launches in, in this. So, so if you wonder if the demand's there, it's, it's definitely there. So uh, we're going to be doing orbital launches in uh, mid next year. We're building the orbital vehicles now. We've got those parts ordered. Uh, our schedule is holding, so we're not having Elon schedules. If we delay, it's going to be months unless something happens. I mean, things can always happen, right? We're subject to FAA regulations, so they could they could put a monkey wrench in the works. But nothing we're seeing today is going to stop us from launching in, in June, July, August of next year. And uh, we'll, if we hold to this, we'll be cash flow positive by 2019. So uh, watch out, SpaceX. So we're building a factory of the future in Tucson, and uh, we're just getting underway with that. And um, it'll be a factory that, uh, that'll be how you really build rockets in mass production. So we're rethinking the whole thing from the ground up and using a lot of the techniques that the, the boutique Italian automotive companies use to build, build cars. So um, we're really rethinking the whole thing from front to back. And that's what's been fun about this is to, is to just take and question everything and just say, hey, is that really the right way to do this? Are these really the right people? And I tell you, there's nothing nicer than to turn down that guy that's wanting a job that you've really secretly disliked for 10 years because you don't want him a part of your company. <laughs> that's, that's the best part. So we get to pick, choose who we have. So today rockets are kind of built like old Maseratis in the 60s. I'm, I'm kind of a Maserati guy. Um, I painfully spend money and time on old burnout hulks of Maseratis. Uh, but, you know, SpaceX, that's, that's essentially what they're doing. They, they have them in a station, and people come and bring the parts and put them on, and when they're done, they take them away. We're talking about something that's a little more like the modern factory where it's a moving body and so forth. So not really, I mean, this is not rocket science, as they say. <laughs> it's not that hard. We just have to think it all the way through. That's the nice thing about this. The technology is all here, guys. It's just, it's just having the market and the business skills and the team and the, and the belief of our investors. You know, we've got some of the best investors in the world, and I, I've just been honored by them. You know, we had a great set of seed investors, and then we got Sequoia. And if, I don't know, you guys probably don't even know who Sequoia is, but if you go into the VC world, I see a few heads going up and down. Yeah, they, they're like, uh, I don't know, they're the, they're the rock stars. They're the, they're, the, they're the Super Bowl winners, you know, if you like football. These guys are awesome. And so what that's done is now we got people knocking on my door wanting to write checks. I had an, an email last night from a really huge fund. He, he says, we're in for your next round of da da da, da you know. And I, I, I did two phone calls with him. And last night I fell asleep and missed a phone call with a, with a Middle East uh, uh, sovereign wealth fund. And I, I suspect that won't hurt me. <laughs> but I missed the phone call because I was too tired. But uh, at any rate, so, so it's good and we're on our way. Um, the team itself... He's got me. John Garvey is, uh, he's actually no longer CTO. He's in charge of manufacturing and operations. Uh, but he's, he's really the brains behind this whole thing. Ken Sunshine's our CFO. He's, if you ever heard of Orbital Sciences, they just sold uh, to uh, Northrop Grumman. He was one of the original guys on that. And uh, so he's been around a long time. Eric's our, our chief French engineering vice president. And so he's the one I tease all the time. In fact, you guys probably don't know this, but Colin worked for these guys about, uh, what was it? It was 2007, so that makes it 10 years ago. And uh, they treated him well back then, and uh, he, he, he uh, did his normal things with him. And then Sean Coleman brings our, our virtual machine capabilities. He's, he's a true Silicon Valley software guy. So we brought that DNA into the company. Again, we're not just relying on old, uh, tired-looking uh, aerospace engineers. We're, we're trying to bring it all together. And uh, we're flying a bunch more of these uh, Block Zeros, and by... Uh, 
mid 2018 we'll be flying the uh the the block ones which will go to orbit so that's kind of our plan there and the software defined satellites we're actually building two of those right now we'll probably launch these on our the first two on our on our third launch we've got our first and second launches manifest and i think we just sold our fourth one they're, they're shuffling around right so there's you know when, when when you get to saying hey i'm actually launching on this date people people tend to shuffle so we had one shuffle out one shuffle in these guys will probably go up late uh, next year, and it'll be just our uh, our first uh, tests of it, and we'll have our first cryptocurrency up there with it as well. So that'll be a that'll be a big deal for us. So that's it, and I guess I probably have another 15, 25 minutes. You can take a break, ask me questions, whatever you like to do. It's kind of up to you guys. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I'll take questions. Yeah. So in the beginning, when you were talking about the abundance of satellites that will be going up uh, compared to how many have gone up in the past 50 years. I remember seeing a, a picture or a video where it shows how many satellites are currently in orbit now, and it seems crazy how much is orbited. Space right? junk. Is that all space junk or mostly? So, so here, here's, here's what's really going on in, in orbit. Yes, there's a lot of objects up there, and yes, there's going to be a lot more. Almost all of the objects that are going to go up over the next five years or in lower altitude. So when you're in space, you say there's no atmosphere. The reality is that's not true. There is an atmosphere. It's very thin. You can count the molecules in a space this big, right? But that you're, you're running 25,000 miles an hour equivalent, you know, you're hitting a bunch of these things and it's still slowing you down. So the, the net effect of this is you get atmospheric drag that pulls these out. Depending on the altitude you're at, it might be a day, it might be a week, it might be a month, it might be years, or if you're up high enough, it might be a century. So most of the stuff we worry about in terms of space junk is actually fairly high up that's, you know, on the order of 25 to 100 year lifetimes. Um, just a little anecdotal story, the Iridium satellite constellation, which is phones that you can use all over the world. They built 100 of those, flew them in 1990. It was like a $10 billion investment by Motorola and uh, didn't turn out so good for Motorola. The company got sold off for $50 million. And at $50 million, that was a great business. So they're still around. I helped them. One of the things that an investment bank asked me to do was go in with a bunch of guys and say, how long are these going to last? They were designed for five years. They're up high enough that they won't come down. But they were made of commercial parts like cell phones. And they're, they're like, we, don't, we have no experience with this. How long are they going to last? So we walked in. We walked through the data with them. And it was very interesting. You know, we found all these trends of what was going on. And there was some you know, screw-ups. And you know, out of the 100, they had like 72 left. And so we, we knew that they needed 65 or so to be viable. So we, we plotted things out, and we told them, until 2017, the bankers, this will be a viable constellation. And the next loss will be because the solar panel goes away because of radiation. Well, within about three weeks of me getting paid, fortunately, for my, for my uh, uh, very expensive report, uh, a, a piece of Soviet booster slams into one of the satellites and takes it out. <laughs> so I got the phone call why didn't you predict that? <laughs> and I said, well, that's an act of God, really. <laughs> but it does happen, right? And that was at a fairly high altitude. So the answer to the, the problem with space junk is, is both good stewardship of what people do. And that comes in the form of, you know, having propulsion you can deorbit when you're done. Number two is if you're low enough, it sort of washes itself out anyhow. So to that end, we actually went out and bought the patent rights to a, an electric propulsion for these little satellites to be able to use so they can deorbit themselves because we, we recognize this as a problem and we can build these little thrusters for like a thousand bucks so it's not a big hit on their on their costs and so forth and they can just run power to it and that's all there is to it. it's just a little titanium uh, rod that gets ablated out so so that's probably the long-term solution to that but it there's also this thing of who's going to be the traffic cop in space. Right now, the U.S. Air Force does it, and they don't want to be in the, in the role anymore. And there's no, there's no payback, right, because there's nobody that's charging you, like, access to the toll roads in space. So there's no way to, you know, economically incentivize somebody to that. So that's a, probably an appropriate government function. But then the governments around the world don't want to share it because then this guy sees what his radar sees, and then you know what his radar can do, and now all of a sudden we've got suspicions and things go to hell. So... All right, I saw a question back there, Blue. Aside from the FAA, what kind of regulations uh, are you subjected to have a satellite in space? Yeah, good question. So if you're in America, it's different than uh, other parts of the world. So 
Um, if we launch a satellite, say from Argentina, I'll just pick a country, um, we have to certify that that satellite adheres to the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which essentially means you don't have a nuclear weapon on it. So that is in and of itself easy. Um, but there's also other things if you've got imaging capability on it, then the, the DOD starts to stick his nose in. That's become less and less of an issue and practically speaking is not an issue anymore. So um, if you're an American satellite, those exact same things apply uh, from a regulatory point of view. You also have to deal with, with the frequencies you're radiating at. So you have to deal with the FCC. You have to have a license for those, those bands and that's for non-interference basis kind of thing. So we're in the middle of all that. The rocket, as you point out, is from the FAA and they, they have to license like an aircraft, the basic design of the rocket to say it's safe. And then every time you fly, like you have to file a flight plan, we have to file a flight plan and get it approved. So we're working with the FAA to try and streamline that process in our case. And one of the reasons we're doing these block zero vehicles is to actually exercise those channels. Um, you know, when I say we're a flight operations and manufacturing company, I really mean it. These block zero vehicles are just dead simple aluminum things we build for 50, 75 K, but it exercises all the FAA channels. And, you know, we're down to two week kind of approval windows now, which is, which is a great improvement over what it's been. So, so yeah, that's one of the things you worry about. I see one by the door here. Yeah, I have a question. Can you talk about the connection between Vector and Nexus a little more? So uh, there, there's no financial connection. Um, there's no organizational connection. It's a, a, a letter of intent that we've signed with them for them to be a customer of Galactic Sky. So, uh, you know, my son's my son, and uh, there's probably a lot of intellectual connection between the two more than anything else. Right here. Um, aside from fuel based uh, rocket development, is Vector working towards any anti gravity propulsion systems? <laughs> <laughs> if, if they had an anti aging propulsion, I'd like that. Anti-gravity helped my weight too, yeah. Um, no, we're, we're just working with ion propulsion primarily. So the problem with ion propulsion, it's, it's electrically driven, which is nice, so you can use power from, from the sun or nuclear if you were allowed to do that, but it doesn't have a lot of thrust. So, so for a heavy vehicle like, like we have, we're really pretty much stuck to chemical for the foreseeable future. Once you, once you get in space, you can use ion propulsion. So. So we, we talk about an auxiliary propulsion system. I call it a third stage. My engineers hate it when I do that because that means certain things to them. Um, but think of it as a third stage, it's electric. And so what we do is we put the satellite up into an orbit that's stable for a little while, like we were just talking about aer aerodynamically. Then you use the electric thruster to, to slowly raise it. It'll take, you know, on the order of a month to get some of these satellites up to where they need to go. But um, you know, the, the difference is, is you only spend a few pounds to get it there instead of like 100 pounds and you have to buy a bigger rocket. So the result is our rockets can put stuff up very high for a third the price of competing rockets with this with this technology. Yeah, um, I think I saw you. Like when do you see the entire like, CubeSat mesh network being built out so that ne Nexus can actually use it? Good question. So um, we raise our money from investors in series, so we just close our series A. We're, we're really, it was probably more like a Series B, but we'll just call it Series A, which means I got a few more. And uh, so our next one is enough to just get us cash flow positive, but it's looking like the market conditions are such we can raise a lot of money on this next one because we can get a good value on our company because you, you raise the money against, you know, a, va a valuation just like Bitcoin on, on your company. So you give away a certain percentage. So my goal is to get that as high as I can. The investors want to get in before it gets too high. So, you know, we're looking at raising a significant amount of money, and one of the things we're going to do with it is, is to flush out this network immediately. So the prototypes go up. Um, we'll get some feedback from those. We're looking at starting, if we raise this money, to probably get the network functional in 2019. And, and since we own our own launch vehicles, we can, we can launch our own stuff. So. What has been your uh, biggest unanticipated challenge up until now? Biggest unanticipated, somebody always asks me a question I can't answer, right? <laughs> What's your favorite thing to do on Sunday? <laughs> I'm teasing you, okay. Yeah, so, so, you know, early on it was raising money. So it was, it was convincing the world that you had the right team, the right idea at the right time. And that was, I'll be honest with you, it was bitch hard. 
and uh, we had some good breaks, and and we we were we were fortunate that we built upon the good breaks, and and we've created a sense of momentum. So that's that's no longer as big an issue. It's always an issue, right? So the second part was being taken seriously by by the customer community, and uh, we're there now. Um, and and one of the reasons is is they see our stuff flying. So. I've always been the guy that says I'd rather talk less and do more, right? I used to tell my kids that. I, I see my daughter in the in the audience. I, I'd say, talk less, eat more, <laughs> you know. So to every all my kids, and uh, so that's that's kind of the the way we've we've run Vector, and I think that's uh, that's done us well. Yeah. So I saw some more. Quick, okay. So all of these Internet of Things developers are, are racing to give us smart toasters and, and put all these billions of devices online. Um, and they're pitching different network connectivity models. Do you, how do you think CubeSats would play into that? Um, you know, you don't have to go very far from, from uh, this place right here to find you've got no cell phone service. Where I live in Tucson, I, I can go not very far from my home and I've got no cell phone service. So there's a lot of places where there's no connectivity whatsoever. Uh, and, and even in very developed countries, that's the case. So I see this as a really big deal. I, I think that, that OneWeb and SpaceX have very ambitious plans and I think they're great plans. I think they're very expensive plans. And I've always been a skeptic of anything that has to be financed with a B, in other words, billions of dollars. So, so you look at Iridium, for example, I, I helped them raise the $2.8 billion for their second constellation to replace an established business case that we knew worked and we knew how much free cash flow we had. We had $350 million a year in free cash flow on Iridium when we were trying to, nobody would finance that. So we had to appeal to the government of France with COFAS, their export bank, to finance that. So you look at OneWeb and all these guys, they've got a huge, huge uh, thing to, to overcome. Even Elon, as, as bright as he is and as capable as he is, he's got a, another CapEx problem to do it. So what I think is going to happen is these, these little small constellations that can be built for millions of dollars for the Internet of Things are going to take some early ground here. Someone's eventually going to be successful with a ubiquitous network in space. But I think things like Galactic Sky, we we're building in that capability to it because we see that as one of the use cases that also becomes part of the cryptocurrency use case, right, as a feeder subscriber link. Now, whether that subscriber link is to a cell phone, if we could get the, you know, the frequency problem solved, because that's a regulatory nightmare. Uh, and, and you could do it off of, you know, little flip phones in Africa, or whether it's, you know, something that's on Wi-Fi, we don't know yet. But we're working, for example, with a, uh, a large rental car company, a worldwide rental car company, that wants to monitor their fleet with this, because their fleet's, half of their fleet's always out of, out of commerce. I don't know what the hell's happening with, you know, billions of dollars of their assets at any one time. So, these kinds of things will start to come in, and, and they'll be bought up, I think, by whoever eventually wins this 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 race. And, and that's part of the reason behind Galactic Sky is to have this is sort of a canvas for, for all you bright guys to put your ideas on and figure out which ones work and not break the bank in the process. So I see a young lady in the back. Yeah, it's almost exclusively Leo. Um, Leo being low Earth orbit for those who don't know what the hell is he talking about. Uh, Geo is geostationary orbit. So if you watch Direct TV, you're getting your stuff from Geo orbit. Problem is, it's something like 22,000 miles away. I forget the exact number. And there's a there's a time delay. So any communications that go up there, it's if you have encryption, <laughs> good luck. So you're you're bouncing back and forth on your keys and so on. So it doesn't work very well. So so. What goes on in geo is usually just really big stuff. It's been divided up by treaty. You know, it's it's like real estate. It's like the front uh, of Waikiki on the beach. So every economic incentive will be to continue to put really big stuff the size of a house up there that has kilowatts of electricity. Uh, the CubeSats take advantage of being closer to Earth because the physics get better. So all this business of communicating with Internet of Things and with Wi-Fi portals and things like that, just it goes down with the square of the distance to, to the object, so it makes everything a hell of a lot easier, and that's where we see it going. Now we do have guys who are we have one launch that I sold to to the moon, 
Okay, the guys are going to take a little cube size about this big, and they're they're going to go win the GLXP with it. That's what they say. So problem is we're not ready for the GLXP, but we think it'll be extended. So so there are possibilities to do other things, but Geo's probably never going to be one of them. I don't think. Uh, I mean, if somebody has a need, we'll we'll put something there. Yeah, yeah, but you know, we we end up with about five kilograms to geo by the time we're done with an electric propulsion. It's not a whole lot. It's a little more than that, but it's it's tiny. Yeah, we say I'm gonna get this guy. Oh no, sorry, that wasn't a question. I'll get you then. So we're we're all RF between the inner satellite links. Um, the optical's not really there yet we're probably going to have a, a little product development activity where we're going to do that the, your subscriber links will probably never be optical because of things like clouds <laughs> so uh the you know ku band is is like one of the the higher ones but people are starting to use w and v bands now so that as that technology matures our our, our data rates i think will be plenty fine Right. Yeah, the question was, you know, Elon's got his plans, and do you think uh, that for going to Mars, do you think he'll be there by 2020? So only Elon knows, and he tends to be very optimistic. But when I told Jesse Ventura this morning, he said, tell me something that's going to shock me. And I said, I said, SpaceX is going to land the first human on Mars within 10 years. And so I've, I truly believe that. The technology's there. You know, it's a matter of the money and the willpower and, and just getting everything ready. So I have no doubt that the first human on Mars is not going to be wearing a, uh, a government patch. That's going to be a private citizen. And uh, I think that'll be a massive, massive accomplishment. Any other questions? Okay. Are you finding time for your book? <laughs> yes, I am, as a matter of fact. Not at this conference. Yeah, I think I saw somebody over here. Okay. Good question. So will the will the CubeSats get smaller with time? Undoubtedly, yes. Will they be useful when they're smaller? I don't really know, honestly, Frank. I think um, I think we proved ourselves wrong when we said in the past they wouldn't be. So I'm I'm reluctant to say they won't be. Um, there's always sort of the laws of physics, but it's amazing how collaborative groups of these CubeSats have been able to do the job of a, of a big one, even when physics are against them. So I, I suspect, you know, for the next five years, we probably won't see much difference on that. We're already seeing these little, these little sats about this big. Uh, there's some kids in Tucson that approach me about launching some of theirs that are pretty impressive. Uh, no doubt that's going to happen. Um, there's, there's a program that kind of came out of some early solar sail stuff I did. We were trying to put a chip on a, a satellite on a chip and then hit that with a high powered laser to go interstellar. So, you know, the, the solar sail that, uh, the Planetary Society is doing that, that I was I was sort of the intellectual godfather of that. Um, that was funded because the guy wanted to do interstellar flight. So before I started Vector, I was involved in this to, to send chips, interstellar chips out there, which I thought was a cool idea, right? Just hit it with a laser and go. So, uh, you know, but for, you know, the kind of stuff we're talking about that makes money probably a ways off. Yeah. Okay. Oh, hi, Ernie. Aerospace, you're racing cars, and then all of a sudden you go, ding, now's the time. And I'm wondering what was it about the cube stats that gave you the impression it was time? So it was about the uh, eighth business plan that I evaluated for investors. And we're talking, these guys are looking at investing $20, 30000000 million in there, where the number one risk was not the satellite they were trying to develop, nor the business plan they were trying to make happen, the fact that they couldn't find a damn launch for this thing. And, and it just, it just all of a sudden occurred to me one day, I said, you know, nobody is solving this problem. There's all these guys that are raising money to do it. And I personally had no faith in them to get it done. Of course, I had no faith in Elon to get things done either. So I could be wrong. Um, but I just said, damn it, there's, there's an opportunity. And, uh, you know, so I called John up, John Garvey. And I say, hey, John, you know, where are you at on this? Because he usually calls me drunk on, you know, after his Christmas party every year. 
Yeah, and you know, gives me an update. <laughs> he's he's happy drunk. <laughs> it's about the only time he drinks, you know. Yeah, and uh, you know, being a good Irishman. And so so at any rate, um, you know, I said, hey, how, how's it going? And he goes, he goes, you know, we, we made a lot of progress. We're really ready to scale this thing. And so I flew down to L.A. with with my CFO, and uh, you know, we met at McCormick and Schmick's and uh, ate some salmon and uh, shook hands on a deal. That's how fast that happened. It was all in about three days. So, you know, you can't, you can't let the moss grow on you. And uh, I, was, I was convinced in my heart that this was something that would work, right? So then I, I said, well, okay, John, it's going to take us six months to, to raise the money. And he says, okay. I said, so you just keep running your business. I'll start selling my SpaceX stock. We'll, we'll figure this all out. I'll go raise some money. So one, one other racing friend of mine, um, Sean Coleman, uh, about this time he emails me and he says, you know, he says, Hey, you got any good investments? You know, I just, I just exited this other company and, and uh, we're looking, you know, my group, I've got this investment group and like to like, to know, if you got anything in space, we're kind of interested in space. And I, and I said, yeah, I've got this great idea for you. <laughs> so, so I put together my pitch charts and I flew up there and, uh, and we, we, we met for lunch and then it was kind of like a scene out of Glenn, Gary, Glenn Ross. How many have ever seen that movie? Got all of that movie, right? You know, I steak knives, right? Yeah, you know, like like the all, all night sit, you know. And he was going to get these guys to sign. That's what reminded me of Jack Lemmon. So I go there and we just start talking. By about two in the morning, we'd snuck into the conference rooms of VMware. I presented to his investment group, and we we'd shaken hands on on a million dollars. So that was our that was our first seed round, right? So that's how fast this happened. That was like a week later. So we didn't have the company incorporated <laughs> by then. So every day has been just like that since. It's just it's just been one blur after another, you know. So then we went out for more seed money, and uh, we had some some good folks that came in on Space Angels, and that was actually a big deal. They gave us a lot of credibility, and then uh, we just we just used that. We got a lot of money out of Arizona. Uh, the the local community really took to us, and we raised an amazing amount of money out of Arizona. So, and then we had a group of cryptocurrency investors who believed in the promise of this for cryptocurrency that they came in and became our, you guys became our biggest, there you are, you became our biggest investors to, before Sequoia. So uh, it was, the, the cryptocurrency community has been very supportive. So you wonder why in the hell I'm here, giving you gratuitous advertisements for Vector. Well, a lot of my investors are here too. So, you know, it's a, it's a good place to be. Yeah. What Sir. Uh, it was a. Uh, it was in one of our uh, bridge rounds, and they they came in with a convertible note. The so cash, not 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 Bitcoin. Although I did take some Bitcoin on it, so uh, that, I I discovered how hard it was to get large amounts of Bitcoin into your bank account <laughs> in in an expedient manner. So, yeah, we eventually got it out, but we took we took fifty thousand in Bitcoin as part of that whole investment just just to say we did it right. Just be one of the first companies that took Bitcoin as an investment. Yep. Not foreign to me, but it, it was, you know, the, all the usual stuff. What's your, you know, corporate numbers. But I, I, I did it through Coinbase, right? And if you, anybody's got a Coinbase account, you know, kind of the BS you put up with there, right? So, you know, I knew that the eyes were on me. <laughs> but, hey, it's legitimate money. Um, I got nothing to hide. And uh, we were one of the first companies to take Bitcoin as an investment. So I'm, I'm kind of proud of that, honestly. And yeah, it's helped me understand it a lot better, too. So I'm, I'm a huge believer in cryptocurrency. Sir. So what, what, is your, um, what do you see going next for blockchain in space? Is there... So it's kind of more Collins area. We're, we're giving his group the tools to, to bring the blockchain up, bring it down, do the node processing in space. So that's part of what our, what our intent is, is allow him to work with, with our guys who are, who are designing this. We're in the middle, literally, of designing Galactic Sky. Um, so, you know, do we have enough processing speed? What kind of latencies? What kind of this? What kind of that? So, you know, really what we need is a, a number of nodes in the sky to get a fundamental operation going. We know that's going to be different on a phase two and probably on a phase three. That's the beauty of what we're doing is this is a mesh network and it doesn't have to be a rigid network that we have to have precisely 76 up there. You know, as we put more up, we get more capability up and we've, we've filed something like 39 patents. And a good majority of those are on mesh networking in space. We found out that was completely uncovered in the patent space. And so on virtual machines in space, 
instead of waiting like four years, our, our patent's issued in six months. So, so nobody else is doing this stuff. And, and it's, it's interesting. The technology is all there. So, so Citrix is a partner with us on, on the virtual machines. So we're using their core. They're, they're totally behind us. Oddly enough, VMware, who we stole their conference room from, was not interested um, in partnering with us on this. So, so we don't see any, you know, that's the thing about this. We don't see any real big stumbling blocks other than being able to raise the money and execute it and get it off. Our biggest risk is execution at this point. Yeah, so the Outer Space Treaty, uh, sort of not as a, a design point, but as a side, um, designated national sovereignty up to 100 kilometers. So one of the issues that was being debated uh, in the 60s, particularly and in the 50s as well, was what's national sovereignty in space? Okay, if you fly an aircraft over the Soviet Union, they reserve the right to shoot your ass down, right? Or vice versa. And, you know, generally the aircraft weren't going over 100 kilometers. Now, when they started flying Sputnik over the United States, that sent sort of mental shockwaves through people that the Soviets are flying this thing over us, even though it's just radio waves, without our consent, without our, our, our ability to do anything about it. And we don't like that, damn it. And so what that evolved into was when the United States then developed imaging capabilities, it was in our interest to be able to image over their territory from space. So everybody agreed in this treaty as part of, hey, let's not put nukes up there, which is a good idea I agree with, that uh, uh, we can't have any jurisdiction above 100 kilometers. So that's 62 miles, roughly. So is that, I don't know, somebody checked me on the miles. I'm rusty on my, my English stuff. But at any rate, um, so the, the, there is no jurisdiction by treaty up there. And we ran, I know this to be true because I ran into this with Moon Express. That's one of the companies I helped start. Moon Express was, we were going to go send a lander to the moon privately, collect the Google X Prize money, and then we've got various customers want to put their private telescopes up there and things like that. When we went to get uh, approval from the U.S. government to do this, they said no. And we said, well, why not? <laughs> right? They said, we have, we have no uh, authority over anything going beyond low Earth orbit, um, and it's because of the 1962 treaty. They said, this is on another body. We don't have any regulatory authority. So we had to go make a law out of whole cloth. And that's kind of a dangerous thing. So here you are, an entrepreneurial company, going to your government who says, we're going to regulate you, damn it. And then they say, well, we don't know how to regulate you. And we have to go teach them what the right regulatory authority is. So, so they eventually came up with a regime that, where they sort of rationalize how they could you know, regulate stuff on the moon now. So, so, but it's through... Through very narrow language, so they're they're always trying to poke holes through it. For in some cases, out of necessity, so it's it's a screwy little. Well, well, how are they regulate what? Right, exactly. So this is U.S. origin spacecraft, and they regulate it because we have a star camera on this thing, and the star camera takes images, and those images might be of the Earth, and so they they regulate what we might photograph on the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I saw another question back here somewhere. Kind of along the same lines, uh, as the amount of launches increases in the next couple of years, do you anticipate additional regulation in the space? We hope for less, and I'm investing in politicians that I hope can stay bought uh, to help us make that less. But that's the damn thing about politicians, they don't stay bought, you know. Uh, Dennis Kucinich, I told him he was, he was the most honest politician I ever, ever met, you know, I believe it, but seriously, um, we're working with them to try to get that regulatory environment down. Right now, today is a good environment for us. Um, you know, out of Arizona in particular, we have some very strong senators that have some strong plane positions that we're using that. I'll be very honest, we have to. Um, but we want to keep the, the man at bay as best we can. And uh, to a certain extent, what's kind of interesting is we're starting to see NASA get very interested in what we're doing because like, like SpaceX, they see us as an answer to something that they've not been able to do. And, uh, you know, I made a joke with Jesse uh, Ventura. Can you imagine government built iPhones and, and uh, uh, laptops? You know, so that's essentially what, what's going on there. They know that day's coming where they're going to have to buy our stuff. So, so we're hoping there's an alignment of interest between what the government regulatory guys are doing and, and, and what we need to do. And I love man. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, we've discussed numerous backup plans for this. Yeah. Yeah. All right, looks like I've gone over my time. Thank you.